Hello and welcome to the second technical session for Module 6, Episode Planning, Writing and Recording Your Podcast. This webinar is brought to you by the Digital Empowerment Project, a nationwide initiative organized by the six U.S. regional museum associations and dedicated to providing free self-paced training resources for small museums. This inaugural series of online training focuses on digital media and technology topics and is made possible by funding from the Muse Institute of Museum and Library Services. My name is Dan Yeager, Executive Director of the New England Museum Association. My pronouns are in the he, him series, and I'm, I am your host for today's program. In this era of virtual meetings, when digital spaces may substitute for our physical sense of place, it's important to reflect on the land we each occupy and honor the indigenous people who have called it home. I am speaking to you from Swampscott, north of Boston, the historical homelands of the Massachusetts peoples. Wherever we're each located, let us acknowledge all indigenous nations as living communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We, the Digital Empowerment Project, recognize that our organizations and those of our members were founded within a colonizing society which perpetuated the exclusions and erasures of many native peoples throughout the United States and beyond. We ask that you reflect on the place where you reside and work and to respect the diversity of cultures and experiences that form the richness of our world and our profession. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Hannah Hethman as our presenter once again today. Hannah is the owner and executive producer of Better Lemon Creative Audio, a production company focused exclusively on museums, history organizations, and cultural nonprofits. She's the author of the popular handbook, Your Museum Needs a Podcast, a step-by-step -step guide to podcasting on a budget for museums. She's a three-time winner of the AAM Muse Awards for podcasting, and her first podcast has been selected for collection by the United States Library of Congress. Hannah lives and works in historic Greenbelt, Maryland. Hannah, thanks for being with us again today. All right, there I am. Hi, everyone. All right, so getting over to my slides. Um, I do have, um, these slides are available for download at tinyurl.com slash hhpodcast2 if you want to have them for notes or just to reference afterwards um, since we're going to cover a lot of information. Um, I will put this at the end as well. And if for some reason this link doesn't work, you can just email me or one of the um, uh, producers of this uh, series and they will get those for you. Okay, so in this webinar, we're going to cover episode planning, mics and other equipment, recording your show, and writing a script. So basically, we're going to cover everything between planning out your show concept, which I talked about in the first uh, webinar, and editing, which we're going to focus, exclude, set, do a whole webinar on that um, next week, um, because that's such a huge subject, but we want to focus on that middle section today. Um, so episode planning, you have to have a plan. <laughs> um, the more plan you have going in, the better. So here's kind of the broad uh, to-do list that you might have. So one, you have your show concept, whatever that is. Then you need to brainstorm episode topics and stories. So recently I did this with the Vagina Museum in London. I work on their podcast with them and their had an ongoing exhibition about periods, menstruation. So is that, okay, what kind of stories do we want to tell? We just made a big list and started thinking about them and then evaluating how they balance out. Do we have too much of this, not enough of that? You know, how deep do we want to get? What do we have our really focused ideas or big concepts? So you're kind of getting it all out there, possible story ideas. Then you might sketch out possible approaches for each topic. Um, so what's the focus, universals, big themes, we're going to talk about that in a second if that doesn't make sense. Um, so you can kind of see on the left there that screenshot of a, of a spreadsheet is the organization of the thoughts as we went through this process, um, my, my co-producer Liz and I, of coming up with ideas for this series for, for the Vagina Museum. So 
okay, let's say we're going to do episode two is about pain. The pain is real. So, okay, what do we want to do? We might want to talk to this person who, you know, goes by the pelvic pain doctor. We want to have a call for stories. We could talk to this person, you know, who'd be a good guest for that. Um, so kind of thinking about, okay, well, who can talk about that? And sometimes that means internally. So this other um, less neat and tidy image there is of some planning I did um, when I was working on a, on a second series of a podcast that I do called On the Record with the National Archives in the UK. And for this show, the guests are always staff members, basically, record specialists within the National Archives. So it's usually a matter of what stories do we have and which of our team members is best equipped to talk about this part of history. So we're kind of writing notes, thinking about how the stories all go together. In this case, it was just three episodes. You can see episode one, two, and three, and I'm making little notes for myself there in that image to, to how do they all fit together? What are the big ideas that we're pulling out? Um, so when you're thinking about evaluating your brainstorm list, like, okay, we have all these possible ideas, which of them is good? I'm gonna bring back up something that if you're in the first webinar last week, you will have seen, but I wanna make sure you see it again. So this is a little snippet from this book called Out on the Wire um, by Jessica Abel, which I really like about basically how to tell stories in audio. Um, and so it has this bit from, quote from David Kestenbaum of you know, the famous podcast, Planet Money. And he has this formula. I'm doing a story about X topic, right? I'm doing a story about civil war history. And what's interesting about it is why. And that's the story. So and what's interesting about it is how many Jewish soldiers actually were Jewish people fought in the civil war and how many of them um, collected a pension afterwards. And that's how we can find them because of the record, right? So something like that. And if you just start with, I'm doing a story about X, um, whether that topic is the railroad in your town. That's not a story. The history of the, you know, the railroad in our town, that's just a Wikipedia entry. What's interesting about it is the way the railroad, for example, um, inadvertently contributed to women's suffrage. You know, whatever it is, I'm making that up, but this is the, the thing we're looking for. So within each topic, trying to figure out what's the interesting thing about this story in our episode, whether that's the story that you're covering over multiple episodes or within each episode. But right now we're kind of focused on the idea of, let's say we're doing one story per episode. What's interesting about it? What's the big things we want to pull out? Another thing is, um, so we're going to go here through a few different ways to think about how to find what's interesting about your story, right? How to turn it from a Wikipedia entry into a story, into an experience, into something fun. Um, so what big question is your episode asking? Um, and a great example of this is the podcast Q&A from President Lincoln's Cottage in um, Washington, D.C. And their podcast is actually all about questions. So they share questions that visitors have asked them that they couldn't answer, that were just too big. And then they go on an incredibly deep dive to ask different um, scholars and academics and different people about this question to, to find out all the possible answers. So their first episode that I had in the whole series, which I loved, was how could Lincoln sleep if slavery was happening? And so if slavery was happening, how could Lincoln sleep? So that's a question. And a question is an organizing principle for your episodes. Then the episode is a journey of answering that question. But right at the beginning, we're posing that question. And then that's what the organizing, you know, so from then on out, everything focuses around how to answer that question. And at the end, we might sum up what we've answered. Um, a little less obvious is an episode from How to Be American, um, a tenement museum from the Tenement Museum in New York City. And they have a, an episode, I don't remember what the title was, something about dough. And the episode description is, ever wonder how pizza became New York City's quintessential street food? Get ready to find out as we unveil pizza's very own immigration story. So the big question here is, how did pizza become New York City's street food? And this is great because you're piquing people's interest, you're kind of posing a question, and hopefully your listener wants to find out. And so that's how you take them on a journey um, rather than just saying, this is the story of pizza. This is the history of pizza. These are some facts about pizza, right? Um, another thing to think about, another way to come at your the meaning, the, the meat of your episode is what's the big idea? What's the what are the bigger themes you want to draw out, right? What is the thing you want your audience to come away with? 
um, maybe a lesson if we're going to be simple about it, right? So for the Vagina Museum podcast, um, one of the episodes we did was about a monk named Marinos who reflects the trans experience. I don't know, we call them trans in history, but this is a monk who reflects the experience of trans people. And so we told the story of this monk, but the big idea that we wanted to communicate was that trans people have always existed and that their stories exist in historical records and stories and legends and even in church history. Um, it's just about looking at them and how we um, you know, save them from perhaps a, a, a whitewashing of the past or a straight washing of the past. Um, and then for another podcast I did for Seven Stories, which is the Center for Children's Literature Museum in the UK, um, we started with a series about Black representation in children's publishing in the UK. And the big idea we wanted to communicate was it is really, really important that Black children in the UK have literature that reflects them, that looks like them, that tells stories that are about families like theirs, that show them um, a world in which they belong and which they are part of literature and that that is critical for them enjoying and being able to um, enjoy and benefit from literature and reading in the way that we all want our kids to um, benefit. So that's the big idea in those. Another thing to look for are universals. So I'm gonna quote this, um, take this quote from Jack Hart in the book Storycraft, which I love. Story makes sense out of confusing universe by showing us how one action leads to another. It teaches us how to live by discovering how our fellow human beings overcome the challenges in their life. And it helps us discover the universals that bind us to everything around us. And the reason I have a picture of Frodo from Lord of the Rings here is because universals um, help us connect to stories that may not seem like they're relevant to our lives. So the very climax of the story of the Lord of the Rings is Frodo in Mount Doom trying to get rid of this ring, right? And here we have a story of a, a creature, a, a, a short human-like creature um, with a magic ring in a volcano tower uh, trying to throw it away in a world that is totally different from ours. So that has nothing to do with the person reading it. But another way to look at that is that is a story about someone making a decision on whether or not to sacrifice something that has become part of them in order to save people that he may never see again, right? So this is a story of sacrifice and of strength and of doing the right thing. Um, and of course there's other universals in that story, friendship um, and fear and love. So when you're looking at your topic, think about what are these big ideas that we can draw out of it that can make this topic a story that's relevant to the people um, that are listening. So um, some examples of that, um, and on the record, we did an episode about Noor Inayat Khan, who was a spy in the First World War, no, the Second World War, sorry, and um, a British spy. And yeah, we could emphasize the strangeness of that. She was a spy, she was um, killed for her work, but we also emphasize the universals. This is a woman who, um, didn't want to go to war. She was peace loving, but she felt like it was the right thing to do um, because she wanted to defeat fascism. So she sacrificed one of her values to fight for another value that she felt was even more important. So this is a story of someone having a complicated decision on whether or not, um, what, what does it mean to do the right thing and deciding to put themselves in incredible danger to fight for a value that they believed in. So that's a universal truth that we can all kind of relate to on some level. Another story we did for On the Record was about a pauper named Daniel Rush who faced the decision of um, basically dying on the streets with his wife for no support or both of them entering a poorhouse and being separated for the rest of their lives. And in this letter to the poorhouse, he describes, this is the only record we have of him, he describes saying, I would rather die on the street with my wife, basically, than be separated after all we've gone through in our long, long lives. He's an old man at this point. And so this is kind of a story that may not be very relevant to a lot of people to be a poor house, a pauper, maybe even an elderly person. We might have younger audiences, but we can all relate to the idea of loving someone so much that you would do anything to stay with them and 
And so the themes of love and companionship and marriage and um, choosing your family members over material gain, um, these are universals. So then if we go back to these two episodes, examples I had in the beginning, you know, for Q&A, we have a big question. If how could Lincoln sleep if slavery happened? It's pretty explicit here. Um, but the universal is empathy with the suffering of others. You know, did Lincoln have empathy? What did it mean to think about that? Um, and did he want to do something about it? And if so, how did wanting to do something about that affect him? Um, how did he wrestle with that? Um, in How to Be American, the big question, of course, how did pizza become New York City's quintessential street food? The big idea is so many quintessential American things are the product of immigration and the cross-cultural exchange enabled, and the pizza is a way for us to get that idea across to people. So when you're planning your topics, you've got your brainstorm, you've kind of decided, here's what we want to, here's what we want to include in, in the series. You can go through each topic and go, what's the big question? What are the universals? What are the big ideas we want to draw out? And that's going to help you think about your episode and come at it with a plan, a strategic plan of what you want to communicate and what you want people to receive. Um, once you know what each episode broadly is about and you don't have to have an exact um, plan of everything that, that you want to cover, you can kind of just have those big ideas, right? Then you can make a list of potential external guests or and or choose who inside your organization can speak about each subject or story. Pretty basic. Now that we have these big ideas, now that we have these questions, who can answer these questions, who can talk about these big ideas, who can reflect on the universals in this, in this history or art or in this science, for example. Things to consider when choosing your guests. Does the guest list of my episode season reflect the diversity of my community or the diversity of my audience? Um, I always really like to, it, it can be really surprisingly easy if you are, for example, a white person, um, someone who is in a majority community to create a whole season and then realize like, oh, we only have white people on this season. Um, and that's not going to give us the full diversity of perspective and experiences that we need in this season, um, which would be every show needs, <laughs> needs that full perspective as well. Um, but then also, you know, are all my guests all men, all white? Does my guest list represent a diversity of communities and experience instead of just having one token person of color or one token queer person? Um, are you really making sure that your guest list um, is looking at this questions that you're asking about the topic, whatever, from, from different perspectives? Is it genuinely diverse? Is it genuinely seek out um, a diversity of experiences and lived experiences and um, life experiences and people and perspectives. Um, and then, you know, in kind of with that, but also separately, is this the right person to talk about this subject? You know, this seems like an obvious question, but like, maybe we should this, okay, well, we got this person, but maybe we should have, maybe they've talked about it too much, right? Maybe they are not going to be able to ask the question the way we want. Maybe I'm, I'm my blanking on examples here, but is there someone else who would be better to talk about this? Um, will this guest be able to help spread the word about the show? There is nothing wrong with choosing guests here and there, or even more than that, that have a large social media following or a larger network um, that, that will help get the podcast out to other people. You know, if you can get a guest that has a lot of influence, even locally, right, a relative amount of local influence or influence within the field or the subject you're talking about, getting them on the show and then asking them explicitly to promote the show and making sure they have the resources like a link and some graphics or whatever, that can be a great way to reach their audience with content that they're definitely going to like because the person they like is on the show. Um, of course, considering how difficult will it be to get this guest on the show and schedule them. So sometimes if you're looking through, um, I like to have like you know, guest number one, guest number two, um, long shot. <laughs> if we could get this celebrity, if we could get this book author, that would be really, really cool. But let's not base our whole episode around it. Let's see what we can do. And then from there, you're going to go ahead and go scheduling and recording the people. And I'm not going to talk about scheduling guests because, you know, I'm sure you can figure that out. Um, what I want to talk about next instead is what do you ask them? So once you have chosen who your guests are, you've confirmed that they want to be involved in the podcast, you need to develop your question list. And 
you do not have to have perfectly scripted questions all the way through. If you're naturally an, an interviewer, someone who knows how to get, you know, to dig into a conversation, that's great. You should at the bare minimum have an outline of what you want to say and what order you want to say it in. Hold on. I was just seeing if I <laughs> had that on a slide. I don't. Um, but that's something I was thinking about talking to you about was thinking about the order you want to have your conversation go. Um, I like to structure my questions or at least an outline of what I want to ask in that order to make it easier for editing afterwards. Um, a few types of questions I like to ask. One, number one, my favorite type of question is questions that invite stories. So tell me about this. Why does this matter? What should people know about pizza? Let's say pizza. What should people know about pizza in New York? Tell me the history of pizza in New York. How did this restaurant get started? How did this museum end up here? What's a common misconception about immigration in New York City? Um, where are we? So that's a question that invites description as well as stories. Tell me what we're looking at. And then it's totally fine at the end to say, what's the takeaway here? What's the lesson um, to get people to reflect? So these are questions that invite stories, that invite description, that invite reflection um, and invite interpretation as well. Um, and so you can think if I say, you know, when was this um, museum founded? Oh, 1905. Okay, well, that, that's not really a conversation. That's not going anywhere. But if I say, tell me the story of why there's a museum here. How, how did this come to be? Well, in 1901, you know, so that, that invites people to tell you a story, a series of events, rather than just a fact. So again, not Wikipedia page, but story. I also like questions that fill in background. So especially if you're doing a little more planned um, interview. So in this case, this is a whole question that I wrote out. Um, and it goes something like, so Jess, rather than easing our listeners into this series with a nice straightforward set of court records, we're jumping into witch trials. Um, blah, blah, blah. And I say, they, you know, kind of fill in the background of what we're not going to talk about. But so could you give us a brief overview of what the witch trials were and what they weren't? That's really the question at the end. What were the witch trials and what weren't they? Um, but all that behind that is background. And the nice thing about this background here is it not only gives us a little fill in of like the context, the you know, cultural context of witch trials, but it also lets my guest, Jess, know that I don't need you to take tell me about that they are in television shows, novels, plays. Um, I want you to jump right into what they were and weren't. We don't need to do an intro, right? So it kind of lets her know as well. In this big question that I'm asking, where do you, where do I want you to focus? Um, Follow-up questions are super, super important. So if you're, I always use the example of, you know, let's say um, your guest is talking and they're like, yeah, um, so they're telling you about this cool object in the museum and um, yeah, and you know, I just, it's really cool how we have it displayed. Um, we were gonna display it here, but that, that, um, that little area got wrecked when the zombies ran through. So now we have it here and that looks so much better. And you're like, wait, 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 wait. Did you just say zombies? So this is like signposting and follow-up questions is when your guest says something and it's really interesting, make sure you come back to that because if your listener hears something interesting and they don't get more information on it, they may feel unsatisfied, right? So you are standing in as the host for the listener. You're asking the questions that they want to know. So a lot of follow-up questions that I like to ask, sometimes it's good to just have these literally written down so you can just pop them back in when you're when you're ready to go. Can you tell me more about that? And why is that? Can you expand on what you've just said? Do you have any more stories from that experience you can share? What else can you tell me about pizza in New York? Why do you think this story is so important? Why do you think this artwork is so important? Wait, did you just say there's ghosts in the museum? So exactly, right? I think our listeners will want to know more about the zombies, the ghosts. Can you fill us in on that? Um, and then also you can wait until they're done and say, so I want to go back to one thing you mentioned, which is the role of the local union in all this. Can you give us some more detail on how they were involved? You know, so I want to go back to that thing. So just making sure you follow up on interesting leads um, so that it's not just conversation, switch topic, question, switch topic, you know, boom, boom, boom. So it has a nice flow through it. Um, 
Then something else to think about is length. Um, this is just a practical note. Um, podcast episodes are typically between 20 to 50 minutes in length. Um, I like to say maybe, especially if you're starting out and you're figuring out your audience, keep it to a, <laughs> within the range of a commute. You know, like let's say if you're, if you're thinking about someone who commutes 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, maybe 20 to 25 minutes is where your episodes should be. Um, if you're at the higher range, maybe you can go 40 to 50 minutes and it's okay to have one episode that's 40, one episode that is 50. But if you're doing 20 minutes, then 50 minutes, then 10 minutes, then 30 minutes, your audience doesn't have a place in their life they can slot you into, right? So if you listen to podcasts, you may listen to the same podcast at the same type of activity because you know it'll fill about that amount of time. Um, you know, if I'm going on a 15 minute errand, I'm going to listen to a short podcast. If I'm uh, cooking dinner, I might put on a long one. If I'm going for a run, I might put on a long one, right? So keep that in mind to keep it in the same type of time slot. Um, and then when it comes to editing, again, we're going to talk about that in the next web webinar, but in recording, it's really important to save yourself time by keeping your interviews closer to the length you want them to be in the end. So let's say you have one guest and your episode should be about 30 minutes. Don't do a two hour interview, do a 30 minute interview, a 35, 40 minute interview, because by the time you edit it down, add an intro and an outro and some music, there you are. Let's say it gets to an hour, you're going to have a lot of decision making to cut half of that interview out. Um, and I certainly made that mistake early on to be like, well, two hours is more, more is more. Then I'll have all this material to choose from. And in the end, I'll have a better show. But that's not the case, because first of all, your guests can then just talk and talk and talk without being concise. Think about conference presentations. What's more interesting, the hour where someone has an hour to ramble or when they're asked to carefully um, you know, focus their ideas into 15 to 20 minutes. Um, now, some guests can go really well for an hour, but focus can also be better. Um, so you don't have to record longer interviews. It's And this saves you time. We all are going to be short on time. This is not a professional operation. You know, if we were this American life and could have an entire staff working on every episode for months, um, we could do, you know, 15 hours of tape and cut it down, but we are not. <laughs> so we have to be practical. So this is just a practical note. All right. So Let's switch to the more technical side of things and talk about recording your tape. And I know I need to pause here for the ASL interpreters, <laughs> ASL interpreters. So hopefully that's given us a moment to pause and shift. And let's talk about equipment. Um, so I'm going to talk about three types of recording. Mobile recording, a studio setup, and remote. So these should be pretty obvious. Mobile, I'm walking and talking. I'm not plugged in anywhere. Studio setup, um, I've you know got something fixed in a room, you know, basically sitting in a room. <laughs> That's my, my definition of studio. And then remote, where we're not in the room together. So I'm going to give you a few mic setups. And so you can just reference the slides later and purchase just that equipment if you want. Um, I don't like to get too crazy on equipment, but there also is no wrong way to do it as long as it sounds good. So if you have a mic you like better or something, just use it. Don't worry about it being wrong. Um, so mobile recording setup, you here's one setup you might use. A Zoom H4N Pro Handy Recorder. This is a favorite of podcasters. Um, I love this. I mean, I haven't used it in a while because I haven't gone anywhere and everything's remote right now, but in the future, you might need this. Um, it's about $200 and you can plug in two mics to that. Um, you'll need an XLR cable and always with recording, you want to wear headphones, whether you're remote recording, in-person, mobile. Headphones allow you to make sure that nothing weird is happening with your sound and kind of monitor what's coming into your microphone. So that's really important. Um, then what you might attach to the recorder is you have, you'll have a microphone and I'm kind of giving you two options here. One is a shotgun mic. Um, these are the long skinny ones. You more often see them on a movie set. This is going to give you a focused line of sound to your person. So if you are in a really loud and noisy environment, um, this will kind of give you a, a more narrow focused, um, sound. And the nice thing about these is they can pick up from a little bit longer away. So if you need to stand three feet away from the person, let's say there's a global pandemic and you don't want to get too close to their mouth, uh, that could be a really great option. Um, an easier mic, those 
need often need more accessories. As you can see with this little setup here, they're gonna be more expensive. Um, a cheaper and easier to wield, uh, less finicky option would be a reporter style mic. You know, you, like you see reporters putting in people's faces. Um, the road reporters kind of a gold standard for this. And then a knockoff cheaper brand that I have used and love is the Movo HMM2. So these are microphones. And as you can see in this picture, that's me with the exact setup that I just showed you on the left, mobile with the Movo HMM2, and historic St. Mary's uh, city in Maryland. So a possible mobile recording setup too is A, you can just record on your smartphone. Um, you're not gonna get as good of audio. You need to be mindful of your environment and always mindful of background noise um, because it's really hard to get that out afterwards. Always being mindful of wind or other people talking, that's the worst. Um, you really can't get that out um, unless it's very faintly in the background. So you can use your app, your voice memo app on your smartphone, or if you want to get a little fancier, you can download the free Rode Reporter app or a similar audio recording app that's going to give you a bit more control, and that will allow you to record wave files. And also, I don't know if you can see the little green things on the Rode Reporter there, um, it'll let you know if you're too close, like it'll go red, like if you're peaking. So you kind of get a better sense of, of your where you should be with your audio and whether it's good audio quality. Um, one thing you can do to kind of make a mobile recording setup that anyone in your office could use that is going to be a higher audio quality is to get something like this tiny mic on the right. This is a Shure MV88. This one's $150. You can get cheaper types like this. This is a really great one if you want to invest. Um, and then that plugs right into the lightning port on an iPhone. Um, and you can then wear, you'll have to wear remote <laughs> um, uh, Bluetooth headphones in order to monitor it because you'll have filled up the lightning port. Thanks, Apple, um, for that. Uh, there aren't a lot of options like this that go in Android phones, but, um, you know, you can try a few different cheaper ones. There are mics like this you can get for as little as 20 bucks. They're not going to sound as good. Sometimes in that case, your built-in speaker is going to sound better. But if you want to get a $20 mic for your phone and test it out and see what it sounds like, go for it. If it sounds good, use it. There's no, there's no hierarchy of, of um, equipment to me as long as it sounds good in the end. So test it out and see what you can do. But if you want a good one, the Shure MV88 is solid. So then let's talk about a studio setup. Um, so uh, possible studio setup number one, you could have a laptop with recording software. This could be Audacity, Hindenburg, GarageBand. So instead of having a handy recorder, you have you record directly into your laptop. And then you can plug in a USB mic. Um, I will show you. This is my, this is the Rode NT USB mini. It is awesome. I hope that didn't sound weird when I was picking it up. Um, I love this little microphone. Not only is it just freaking adorable, it gives you a great sound. It's also great for narration. It's small enough and compact. It doesn't need other accessories. It's all built in stand, built in pop filter. So if you need to send it to a guest, you can as well. So it's pretty sturdy. It costs about $100, but um, it's, it's my favorite mic right now. Um, other similar mics you could do are the Audio-Technica ATR2100 and the Samsung Q2U, and you can often get um, uh, discounts and bundles on those. Like if you look on Amazon, you might be able to get the headphones and the cord and the stand all in one podcast packages. Um, yeah, um, a lot of people in podcasting kind of starting out get the like blue uh, Yeti, blue um, or the Snowball, and I don't really like those microphones. I don't really think they're worth the money. So I don't recommend them. They do look cute, but uh, I think that's about it. Um, and so then you would plug that in, put it on your um, table. You could have two microphones, but you'll need to have make sure you have a connector um, to get two of them plugged in, you know, USB port into your laptop and record that way and test it out. Obviously the mics are facing away from each other, or if you're just recording one person. You could also just sit really close to the, the same mic, but it's better to have two separate tracks. A separate setup that's much more expensive, and I know we're talking to small museums here, but I wanted to show you the top of the spectrum. If you wanted to drop $1,000 on your podcast setup, you're like, we're going to do this in our museum. We're going to do it every week. We're going to invest. We're ready. The Rodecaster Pro is kind of like a little 
built in everything you need in one place podcast studio. You can attach four mics via XLR cable to that. Um, and you can get studio mics like the Audio Technica AT2020. These are fantastic. I have one. I love it. I use it for everything. If you listen to the audiobook of my book, um, the first edition, um, the audiobook on Audible, that's what I used to record that. Um, so again, you'd use your headphones. I mean, but the broadcast Pro is $600, but it's kind of all in one if you want something. It's also super, super user friendly um, if you don't like like mixing, sound mixing and stuff. Um, so then let's talk about re remote recording. Um, right now, <laughs> this is what we're all doing, right? Like there's nothing else. I wanted to give you the other stuff, but right now this is all I've been doing for, oh gosh, coming up on, you know, almost on, on two years really. So um, let's say I am in Maryland and I wanna record an interview with Lil Nas X in Los Angeles. Um, to congratulate him on being amazing and awesome at his new album coming out. So what I like to do is have a, you can do Zoom, right? Just a standard Zoom call, but you need to make sure in the back end that you're recording separate tracks. That's really important. Or I would recommend upgrading for just a few dollars a month to Squadcast. And so Squadcast is super, super cool. It is like Zoom, but just for podcast recording. So you'll be able to see your people and watch them, um, you know, just like a, a Zoom call, it's very familiar. You join from a Chrome browser, it's really easy. It's easy for your guest. Um, and then it, when you hit record on your end, with the big red button, it automatically records separate wave and mp3 files for each of your guests so when you have a separate audio for each of your guests if i talk over little nas x um i can separate that in my editing and cut me off so that we don't lose any of his precious voice um so what we're going to do in this situation is i would be wearing headphones on my end i would have a microphone on my end just like i have now ideally lil nas x would have a microphone on hand but if he or your other guest doesn't you can ask them to just wear headphones with a microphone in but it's really important that they wear headphones because we can get like feedback loops and stuff with them you know if you've had the echo on a, on a zoom call or someone's <laughs> someone's uh microphone is picking up the audio that, that's going in so if you want to get a little more complicated, um, you can do either backup recording using your smartphone, or if nobody has a microphone, um, you can do a backup on that as well. Um, so what we do this, I do this for all kinds of organizations. I hope this crazy chart isn't too crazy, but basically I take my phone and I open up my voice memo app or a road reporting app, and I put it on the table in front of me about like as if I'm, you know, chatting on smartphones. So kind of this high, um, like clavicle height and, you know, maybe a, a slightly bent arm away from me and I hit record. And then I have my headphones on. So the only thing this phone is picking up is my voice, right? Because the Zoom call is just going straight to my headphones. Lil Nas X is doing the same thing on the other end. And then I ask him to email it to me. And now I have two separate in-person recordings of our voices. The problem with this is you can't monitor whether someone's fan is being picked up in the background or whether it's just not sounding right. So for me, ideally, it's great to have the Squadcast recording or the Zoom recording and this backup. And then if one of them is bad, I at least have a good one, right? Because I'm not going to get a second chance to interview Lil Nas X. Um, the other nice thing about Squadcast is that it records locally. So if the internet cuts out, on one side or the other, it's still recording. And then when you hit stop, it uploads. So ideally you get a non-internet-y sound. Zoom, you will not get that. Zoom, you will get the internet sound. So if someone cuts out, you know, that kind of break, you're gonna get that. So that's why I like Zoom. Okay, um, got a few more slides to go through before we reach the end and have some time for questions. I might edge into my question time a bit. Um, where to record? First of all, always wear your headphones um, when you're recording. And then always be aware of how the environment will affect your sound. It is so much easier to set yourself up for good audio than it is to fix bad audio. Um, one of the big things you want to do is avoid echoey spaces. So that um, image in the top of the you know office with the you can just imagine how echoey that room is, right? That is not a good space for recording. 
um, you're going to have an echoey noise. My office probably sounds echoey. It's probably sounding echoey right now. I don't record in here. <laughs> um, that uh, office on the bottom that's messy and has bookshelves and carpets, that's great. Rooms with carpeting, rooms with things on the wall, rooms with furniture in them that has like even a, a bedroom, right? Or even a closet if you want to. Um, that's where you, that's that stuff muffles the noise and gives you a non echoey noise. Um, you want to watch out for loud background noises like running AC fans, AC units or fans or street noises, especially if you live on like a street where someone revs their motorcycle. <laughs> I have had to redo so much stuff where I don't hear the motorcycle revving until I'm going back into my audio. Um, and then you can get creative, you know, and when I was living in London um, two years ago, I lived in a apartment with one room facing a busy street where the ambulances like to pull out and turn the sirens on from the hospital. So I would open up my closet doors and kind of move my, like a wardrobe, move my clothes aside, hang up a blanket behind me. And there I have a, a cozy little recording office. So blankets, that kind of stuff works great. And then just bottom line is you want to test and assess before every recording um, until you're really, really confident. But even then, uh, I would recommend doing that all the time. So do a little test, whatever you have a setup, do a little test um, remote call with uh, someone else in your office just to make sure everything's working. And then you listen to the audio and go, okay, that's good. Um, Cause sometimes you might listen at your test and go, oh my goodness, there's something in the background that we had no idea. Uh, so this is really important. Okay. Last, I'm gonna take just a few minutes to talk about writing and recording a script. So, there are kind of two broad roles of a script so, or narration in your in your audio. It might just be an introduction, an outro, and a transition. That's what on the left you can see that the script is in italics, and we have Marsh Davis of Indiana Landmarks um, saying a little quote at the beginning to kick us off, and then I have the uh, host Jane saying, "Welcome to Preservation Profiles, a podcast by the National Preservation Institute." So on the stock intro, and then my guest today is Marsh Davis. So just introducing the show introducing the guest. And then in the blue, you can see we jump right into her question. And then it's just a question and answer style podcast all the way to the end, where we have another little outro scripted, thanking people, saying where to learn more, and so on. The other more complicated role of narration might be as exposition, interpretation, and transition. So this is a little screenshot from the script of um, Who Stories for the Seven Stories Museum that I kind of referenced earlier. So you can see the italics guest, italics, guest, italics, guest. So we're going back and forth where the host and um, writer of this show who worked with me, Rafaro, she kind of summarizes what the guest is saying and breaks up the guest speaking to kind of allow us for this nice pacing between guest and, and the narrator and guest and narrator. This is more the public radio, this American life style of podcasting. Um, so when you are writing for audio, you want to write like you speak. This is really important. A lot of people make the mistake of writing. You know, a lot of us are academics. A lot of us have gone through degree programs and we want to write, you know, formal um, essay language or formal book language. But that's not what works in podcasting. You want to write like you speak. So always read through the script out loud at least once or twice while you're working on it. Because as you read it out loud, it might feel weird to kind of try and say something and it might look technically good in reading, but in audio, you need to put the the, um, the most important information first and the, the way the sentence syntax changes as well. So you want to use straightforward, simple vocabulary, avoid jargony academic words that you wouldn't normally use in a conversation, you know, vis-a-vis -vis or, um, you know, juxtaposition or, you know, just thinking about what do you actually say when you're talking to people. You may, I know when I write, I tend to use bigger vocabulary. So I want to switch to my speaking vocabulary. I want to use short sentences, avoiding unnecessary clauses and digressions within the sentence. So this, I'll give you two examples here. This first one's really not so bad. John Davis, who, but it could be better. John Davis, who ran the organization from 1992 till its eventual closure in 2003, spoke to us from his office about the struggles his staff, most of them new to the field, faced in those early years. In writing, if you're reading it on the screen right now, that probably looks fine. But if you're just listening, you might get lost. And by the time you get to the end, you've kind of had to be sorting out things in your head. It just doesn't work right. So what I would do instead in audio is 
break it up into manageable bites of information. John Davis ran the organization from 1992 to its eventual closure in 2003, period. He spoke to us about the struggles his staff faced in those early years, period. At the time, most of them were new to the field. So this is a much easier way to process information when you can't read or go back. You're getting it one bit at a time. You don't have time to go back and check and make sure you understood. For recording your script, you want to practice reading the script out to someone else. Um, that can be a great way to, again, work out the kinks, but also practicing being natural, right? Um, one way is if you can't get out of your head, practice reading it in a silly voice or accent the whole way through. That'll loosen you up. Um, make sure to test out your space setup. Um, it can be really simple. Again, this is a, you know, public media people uh, showing off their spaces for recording like NPR segments during the pandemic or whenever when they're on the road. And then um, what I like to do is record two takes of each paragraph in your narration. Um, so small sections. So rather than going start to finish and then start to finish, um, it makes it really hard to compare the two takes. Record paragraph one, paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph two, and so on and so on. And then as you're editing your narration, you can really easily compare that take one was better than take two or, um, you know, evaluate that way. Um, take lots of deep breaths from it can be really easy to get breathless when you're reading a script. It's surprisingly difficult. So just feel free to take long pauses and speak slowly and take deep breaths where you need them. I'm rather doing that. Um, you can always edit it out, but it's easier to, to do it right the first time. And then drink lots of water. As I'm doing now, when you're speaking and speaking, you get dehydrated. And that can lead to your voice changing. Um, and that is it. So that is recording and your podcast and writing, planning your episodes recording your podcast and writing your script. So again, you can download the slides at HH Podcast 2. And that's my webinar. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Wow. That was a lot of info. <laughs> Take a drink. So um, a couple of questions uh, regarding uh, scripting, it, what you were just saying and reflecting on it, does this mean that pretty much you need to be consistently one person scripting your podcast or can you shift off duties uh, throughout it? Because, you know, your voice is your voice, but then somebody else is going to have a different style and a voice. What do you recommend for that? I mean, I think, you know, technically the best practice is probably to have consistency. <laughs> but, you know, we can't with museums and with museum podcasts, like we're not holding ourselves to the standards of this American life of things like that. And also, I don't think all our audiences are really going to know the difference that much from one to the other unless they've been listening for years and you have this huge audience. So it's OK to switch from one to the other. I think keeping it in the same general style, you know, if one person wants to go really academic and the other person wants to be really friendly and casual. Um, if it works for you, do it. But I would say ideally keep some sort of consistency in the style and tone between them. Um, and you can intentionally rotate people in and out. Um, that's what we do with On the Record the National Archives because none of the staff can commit to being the voice of the podcast every single episode. So every mini series or single episode, you know, we usually rotate, we have two hosts, we rotate one host. So someone does two episodes and they there's a different set every time. But we keep the intro exactly the same. We keep the style the same. You know, you have teaser clips, intro, music, and then to the interview. Um, so it's familiar for people. Because, again, I don't think people know the difference too much between when we switch out hosts. They're not that rabid of listeners. Right. Um, but that familiarity will make them feel comfortable from one episode to another. Okay. So uh, some of the questions that we've seen from attendees here today uh, have to do with equipment, naturally. I think we're all storytellers or more more storytellers in the museum field, but this whole notion of what, what, what do we need? Um, so uh, very interesting about, you know, the, people are interested in like the longevity of equipment, how you migrate from one thing to another, perhaps as you learn. Can you speak a little bit mm. about like how, uh, you know, should you start out, if you're starting out, should you sort of get the you know, base level, whatever, and then decide what works and not, and then kind of work your way up? Or should you just, you know, here's my budget and I'm going to buy everything I need to and then learn how to do it all, all at once? Yeah, I think with all the equipment I've shown, um, it's most important that you take the time to test and figure out what sounds good and what doesn't sound good. I think it's like, you know, you can get the big massive camera and walk out to the pond. Um, 
and start taking pictures, but it's not gonna uh, National Geographic make <laughs> if you don't know how to frame a shot um, or you don't know what color looks good and what does and what time of day to take pictures, that kind of stuff. Um, so someone with an iPhone might outshoot you uh, in, that, in that case if they really know how to use their equipment. So I think some of those mid-range items I talked about, like the $100 mics, that's a great range if you have the budget and you wanna start that's a good place to start. Like this Rode NT mini USB that I have right now. I love, love, love it. It's look at it. It's so cute. <laughs> I have, I make everyone use these. Um, if you have the budget and you want to do a setup and you have someone on your team who has a sense for audio and audio quality, great, go for it. But if you buy all the expensive equipment, the thousand dollar setup, it, it's not going to necessarily sound much better than this hundred dollar mic here um, plugged into my computer if you don't know how to make it sound better, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I would say it's totally okay to start with a solid basic microphone and something that feels comfortable and not scary to you. When I first started podcasting, I did cry when I opened the manual to the, <laughs> um, the, the Zoom uh, handy recorder. Um, I cried a lot and I almost gave up. <laughs> then my career would have gone nowhere. Um, but also YouTube videos are great for figuring this stuff out. If you plug in the microphone you have or the equipment you have, that's great. But start with something that feels manageable. And when you feel like you've done everything you can to make it sound as good as possible, you've put, uh, taken all that low-hanging fruit, then maybe think about upgrading. Yeah, yeah. And batteries. It, it, carry batteries with the Zoom, right? Oh, my it, God, yeah. Yeah, right? You know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I will say this, you know, the thing that resonated with me from my podcasting days, and I did a lot of interviews, as you may know, uh, going to museum conferences and putting the mic in front of people's faces and so forth. And being out remote, um, it, you become so aware of ambient noise, of sounds in the background, things that are happening. And, you know, it, it really is important to sort of pick those spots. I mean, if you're, you know, rather than interviewing somebody in the big hall in a convention center, pulling them aside into yeah. you know, sort of those little spaces, maybe in a, in a hotel conference room or something is so much more helpful to be able to do it. Unless you want that sort of exciting feel. Sometimes, you know, the person on the yeah. street interview has that ambient sound. So that's kind of a, you know, a cool thing too. So um, any particular, uh, you know, sort of anecdotes about interviews that have gone haywire, you know, and what should you be looking out for? You know, the, well, you mentioned sirens, that always happens. You can, do you, do you sort of stop the person and say, you can do it, you know, try that again, say that again, so you can edit that yeah. out or do you just sort of go through it? A really important thing is active listening. It can be really easy when you're interviewing to think about the next question, but then when the siren comes, you have no idea what they were saying. If you are actively listening to them, not only are they going to give you better information, they're feeling like they're listened to, you're nodding, you're doing nonverbal affirmations of their story. Um, but then the siren comes, you be like, so what you were saying was, I went downstairs. I'm like, okay, I went downstairs. And so you can help them pick up where they were, or if they lose their train of thought, you can get back to that. Um, I think probably interviews that have just not gone well for me are when someone was talking super, super fast and like, and like something was going wrong. And I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable enough to be like, Hey, let's take a minute. Let's slow down. There's no rush. I'll give you as much time to talk about this as you want. Let's, um, let's take a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, or let's take a breath or I didn't, I knew that something was not quite good, but I just didn't feel comfortable interrupting that person. I mean, it's ideal if you don't interrupt them, but if you are hearing something that's not going to be good or something's weird with their microphone or if they have a headset and it slipped down, you can't hear them, find a good break to stop and then, but remember where they were speaking so you can give them that, that answer. Um, and I think, you know, on the, on the flip side, the interviews that have gone the best of the ones where I just like kind of leaned into it and let people do their thing. I was up in Iceland in the north and this woman was really, really shy. Um, and she said, Iceland, the accent was really shy. Um, and she kept speaking in Icelandic to the other guys in the room to like ask them a question and then had to come back and think about it and then answer. So there's these wonderful moments where she's turning aside, speaking Icelandic and they go, okay, so what's going on is, and I'd kind of fade out the Icelandic and bring, bring the English back in. 
But I found I was surprised by when I actually went to edit it because I kept my microphone nice and close to her. It didn't matter that she was quiet or shy. I edited it and it made her such a relatable figure. Um, and, and her voice was so, um, people ended up loving that episode because her voice was really, really sweet and nice. And um, it, it was very intimate. You know, right. she wasn't shouting. Right. So. I know you'll get into editing next time, but is it like as you're interviewing, are you thinking to yourself, I can edit this in a way that it'll be better than it is right now? Or are there some yeah. things that you just know you're not, you can't edit out and you have to start over again? Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing I didn't cover is sometimes people will trail off and you know that they're they're doing great. They're like, yeah, this is so good. And then they like trail off and you're like, there's no ending to this. I, I can't edit this. So what I like to do is, you know, um, can you can you say that in another way? Can you can you just say that again? I think just so we can get a different maybe, you know, tell me about that again. I want to maybe like feel free to tell people to say that again. You know, I think I'd like to hear that again just so we can make sure we really got that subject. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me that story again. Let's let's start. Give me give me that again. Just one more take, and then they might do it again. Because if you don't have an ending, you don't have an ending. And um, if I hear that people are trailing off, and I'm kind of at this point where the, the interview just kind of over, um, then I will say, "What's the big takeaway here?" Or we've got a TED talk, and you've got ten seconds to give a ten second TED talk on this topic to the whole world, what do you want to say? How do you sum up everything, the importance of everything in just two lines? And some people go, oh, I'm like, just take your time. And they're like, well, you see the importances and they come back with this pithy line. So I think it's don't be afraid to ask people to give you an ending or don't be afraid to ask people to go back and, and finish their thought. Yeah, with the wrap up. Some of the questions uh, in our chat look as though uh, they have to do a little bit with the pandemic. And I guess the question is, what do you anticipate in live interviewing people? You know, again, are there going to be, you know, things that you can literally put on your microphone or sanitize the mic to make people feel more comfortable? Or do you think you're going to be distancing a little bit? Or, you know, what do you think your approach is going to be as you come out of this? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's I think there's it's so easy to do remote recording. It, it is honestly so much easier than in person recording with the equipment that I'm going to keep doing remote recording until everyone feels safe, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the microphone in their face and then maybe, you know, sanitize it afterwards. But um, right. yeah, I mean, one of the things is having a shotgun microphone will allow you to be a little farther back, but get that nice upfront intimate sound like that with the recorder mic, you might have to be here. With the right. shotgun mic, you could be farther away, um, but I have no idea. <laughs> do you ever, with with interview subjects, uh, do you ever offer honoraria to any of those, or is that something that's just completely out of the equation? No, I think that's absolutely in the equation. Whenever you can pay your contributors, pay your contributors, um, whatever you can come up with, um, whether it's you know, a fee for their time, or you ask them what their fee is. Um, you know, for me, I'm I'm often working with the museum. The museum is paying me, and so then the honorarium is is between them, um, and I encourage them to do that. Um, so I'm I guess I didn't think of it because I'm not often the one paying people, um, but I do try um, to when I when it's in my power to also pay people for their contributions. Um, I know that you can't always, and I think if you're asking someone to do an interview. Um, it's not the kind of thing that always it's like you must be paid for. Like if you're asking them to work on the podcast, absolutely, yeah. you, they should be paid right. for it. Um, so I think it's okay to ask someone to, to speak on the podcast for free, especially if you're going to promote them. Um, but it's totally valid for them to ask. And if you are at all possible to give them compensation for their time, you should. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, you know, sort of like doing the, the book review, book promotion thing. Versus getting somebody to do, you know, actual content and their expertise, there is a little bit of difference. You're helping yeah. them versus whatever. Um, one question is, um, how do you keep the podcast from sounding staged and mm. make sure it's natural sounding? I know you said that, you know, sort of make it, conver uh, you know, script it like it's a conversation. But are there any other, you know, tips that, uh, that you can offer that, uh, you know, kind of keep it natural and flowing? Yeah, I think in terms of the script, again, reading it out loud and practicing saying like that. And if you're the kind of person who just cannot read from a script, but you're really good to speak, give yourself some pointers and speak for five minutes and then chop out some lines to turn it into your introduction. Like it's okay to do to do that as long as it's, 
you know, if you're planned, you don't have to have a script. Um, I'm working on a project right now where it's going to have two pretty well-known co-hosts and neither of them really like to write things. They want to talk. And so we're going to give them bullet points and let them talk. And then I'm going to cut, edit it down. And then, so we'll have cleaned up narrow, you know, in, in between dialogue, but, um, but I, but it'll sound natural and they'll be able to do their thing, but without it being, you know, a conversation that never ends. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then in terms of the interviews, warm up your guests, um, chat to them ahead of time, let them know this is informal. We're just going to chat. You can stop and start, or, you know, here's who you're talking to. Um, we really just want to have a conversation and then ask questions that inspire their passion. Um, you know, why does this matter? Why should we care about this? What would happen if this were lost? Right. Um, this gets them feeling excited and it stops them from being like, sometimes, you know, you're chatting with someone beforehand and they're all passionate and they're excited yeah. and you put the mic in front of them and they're like, our organization was founded <laughs> yeah. in 1901. And you're like, where was the story? Yeah. So it just keep pushing them, asking questions that draw that out and being like, you were telling me a pretty good story in the beginning. Can we come back to that? Um, you know, or tell a joke, lighten up the mood, whatever you can do, yeah. if appropriate, um, in the subject yeah. matter, um, that helps it just feel natural. But then also, I think it's okay for podcasts to be a little corny, um, <laughs> to be a little staged. I think people are used to it. I love the podcast by the book by, um, Kristen Meisner and Jolene, um, I forget her name, but it's like, so Joe, how's it going? Well, Kristen, this is what I did this week. And it's a little corny, but like, yeah. it feels fun and it feels authentically them. And they kind of lean into the silliness of, of yeah. that. We all know it's, it's scripted, but um, yeah. Right. So I think it's okay to be a little corny in podcasts. Good tips. Well, our time is up, unfortunately, but uh, Hannah, once again, thanks so much for sharing your wisdom. It was uh, fantastic being with you again. Uh, and everyone out there listening today, thank you for attending uh, today's program. Uh, if you enjoyed the program, then please do us a favor and share it with your network. We really appreciate your participation and hope to see you again in future programs. And please join us for tech workshop number three as Hannah leads us through podcasting, editing, and production. We'll see you then. Take care. <laughs>